In this video, we're going to be grokking monads just through the category theory. Categories aren't just some made up abstractions. Categories are the way they are because people discovered them by looking at hundreds of things and their relationships. Categories are the basic construct of category theory. A category consists of the objects and morphism, which are also called arrows. Objects are expressed in the terms of morphisms. Morphisms can be composed. The following axioms must hold. Every object has an identity morphism that serves as a unit under composition, and the composition of the morphism needs to be associated. F is a morphism with a source object B and a target object C. If we have a morphism G from A to B and F from B to C, they can be composed and make a composition from A to C. Standard mathematical notation isn't the easiest to understand. When it comes to equations and laws of the category theory, commutative diagrams are a different way to represent categories and their relationships. For example, a category C with object A and B and morphisms F from A to B and G from B to A can be drawn like this. All directed paths in the commutative diagram with the same start and end leads to the same result. Make sure to say that diagram commutes every time you see one to get extra points. The identity morphisms are typically not drawn. They always exist and would only add noise to the diagram. A functor is a transformation or a mapping between categories. It's a way to turn one category into another. Given category C and D, a functor F from C to D associates or maps each object A in C to an object F of A in D. It also associates or maps each morphism F from A to B in category C to a morphism F of F from F A to F B in D. Note that different objects in C don't necessarily map to different objects in D. Functors are not necessarily injective. For example, functor maps object A, B in C to an object F of A, F of C in D, and also maps each morphism F to a morphism F of F. As you can see, this diagram commutes. Also, when you see this, feel free to pass and traverse the possible paths with your finger. A functor preserves identity morphisms and the composition of morphisms. F of identity on A is the same F identity on F of A. Given an identity morphism IDA on an object A, F of IDA must be the same identity morphism on F A. And F of composition is F of F composed with F of G. Let's go one step further. A natural transformation is just a way to transform one factor into another. Given just two functors F and G between categories C and D, a natural transformation alpha from F to G is a collection of morphism in D. For every object X in C, there is a morphism alpha called the component alpha at X. What does natural transformation have? There are morphisms F of F from fx to fy and g of f from g of x to g of y in d because f and g are functors and there are morphisms components of alpha alpha x from f to g and alpha y from f to g of d for every morphism f x to y in c we have the naturality condition g of f composed with alpha x equals alpha y on f of f. If the diagram commutes, the condition is satisfied. So a monad is just a special type of functor from 
a category to the same category with some additional structure. A monad consists of the functor T from C to C and two natural transformations, mu called join or multiplication and eta called unit. Mu is a natural transformation from the functor composed with itself back to T. It's also called the square of the functor, T square. Eta is a natural transformation between the identity functor, ID on C, and T. This natural transformation must satisfy the following laws. The associativity laws says that we can multiply on the right first or on the left first, and the result is the same. The two ways of reducing the cube of t down to t must give the same result. We can either map mu over t, collapsing the inner two layers of t cube first, denoted by t mu here, or we can lift mu to t, collapsing the outer two layer first, denoted by mu t here. And the t square can be reduced to t using mu. If the diagram commutes, the law is satisfied. Two unit laws, left and right, says that when we just apply unit to t and then multiply, we get back t. We get back to where we started. Eta t adds a new t layer outside to the left, t eta inside or to the right. If the diagram commutes, the laws are satisfied. At this point, we could just see how this translates to Haskell. The join function, roughly speaking, just takes a functor of a functor and just flattens it into a single layer. Pure just lifts an element into a functor. Not that we're going to use pure and pretend like return doesn't exist, but you'll definitely bump into return here and there. If you're curious why, see the course notes. And we can treat monads as just functors with two additional combinators. Note that the functor is a superclass of the monad and ensures that it has the ability to map. Alternatively, Haskell developers prefer to define monad in just another form. In order to implement a monad, we need to specify just these functions, pure and bind not pure and join as category theorists might expect. No worries, implementing pure and bind is equivalent to implementing pure, fmap and join. Proper implementation of flat map gives us proper join and vice versa. Note in either case, the programmer implementing monad instance is responsible for making sure that monad laws are satisfied. But on a serious note, Monads in category theory is a powerful idea and there are many ways to approach it. We've just barely scratched the surface and just look at them from one side. Fortunately, it's just entirely unnecessary to understand category theory in order to understand and use monads in Haskell. It might give you just a better understanding of the concept, but at the end of the day, the definition of monads in category theory and in Haskell are still going to have different presentation. So I'll re-emphasize, don't read monad tutorials. But if you want to keep working on the puzzle, feel free to check out the rest of the course, including the exercises to test what we've learned. Thank you for watching.